and they should serve in wars authorized and called for by the United States Congress, not the United Nations. At the moment, there are uprisings taking place across the Middle East. The problem with sending U.S. military to help rebels in Libya or anywhere else is that we are taking sides in a conflict and on behalf of a people whom we know nothing about. When or if there is regime change in Libya, what kind of leadership exactly will replace Gaddafi? Who are the Libyan rebels exactly? The Daily Telegraph reported over the weekend that some Libyan rebel leaders now claim they have members of al-Qaeda within their ranks and are glad to have them. Why do we have American soldiers, our best and bravest, helping people in Libya who may be the very same people we ask our military to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq? Intervening in a civil war in a tribal society in which our government admits that we have no vital interest to help people we do not know simply does not make any sense. Libyan society is complicated, and we simply do not know enough about the potential outcomes or leaders to know if this will end up in the interest of the United States or if we are in fact helping to install a radical Islamic government in place of a secular dictatorship. Of even more lasting concern is how our troops were committed to this battle by President Obama. The Founding Fathers understood the seriousness of war and thus included in our Constitution a provision stating that only Congress can declare war. The decision to wage war should not be taken cavalierly. As Madison wrote, the Constitution supposes what the history of all governments demonstrates, that the executive is the branch of power most interested in war and most prone to it. It has accordingly, with studied care, vested the question of war in the legislature. If President Obama had consulted Congress, as our Constitution requires him to do, perhaps we could have debated these questions before hastily involving ourselves in yet another Middle Eastern conflict. While the President is the commander of our armed forces, he is not a king. He may involve those forces in military conflict only when authorized by Congress or in response to an imminent threat. Neither was the case here. We are already in two wars that we are not paying for. We are waging war across the Middle East on a credit card, one whose limit is rapidly approaching. We already borrow money from countries like China to pay for our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Should we continue borrowing money and saddling future generations with debt to pay for our current actions in Libya? The subtext to the President's speech concerning Libya tonight was, what if we had done nothing? But a better question might be, what if helping Libya's interests actually hurts America's interests? What if we are sending our military to places where we might actually be helping the same terrorists we fight in other countries? It's time that we re-examine these policies by once again consulting the Constitution on such matters and the common sense principles that made this country great. We can no longer afford to spend what we don't have, and we can't afford to address every other nation's problems before we address our own. Over the coming days and weeks, Congress will force President Obama to confront these questions. Our brave young men and women have answered the call of duty time and time again over the past decade. Our soldiers deserve, at the very least, that before we send them into a third war, that Congress, the People's House, deliberate, debate, and decide whether this war is in our vital national interest. Thank you for listening tonight, and God bless the United States of America. So after this, and you know, since he decided to clear war on somebody and kill children, the question is, um, why do we need a Congress? Maybe that's why they made the Super Congress. Maybe now you're understanding how they manipulate that, that prostitute media that lied you into how many wars, told you it was guys in caves, yet the Flight Manifest, which I actually have right here, you know the 9-11 Flight Manifest? Not one Arab name, not one Muslim name. But we're told it was 19 guys with box cutters in caves. <laughs> Sharon residents are smarter than that. We are. We're smarter. We, we can figure that out. But anyway, yeah. Hmm. Here's Barry Zwicker. He's going to show you how they sold you the first Gulf War. Remember, we were told they were throwing babies from incubators. Can you believe that? Oh, my God. Babies from incubators. Here you go. Iraq attacks Kuwait, claiming the Kuwaitis are slant drilling into Iraq's oil fields. U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush pushes for a land war so against Iraq. But polls show the U.S. public is split 50-50 on that idea. 
Then comes this eyewitness testimony before a congressional committee from a 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl. The claim is she cannot be identified for fear of reprisals. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. The U.S. public is outraged. The result? Support for land war zooms. It's a turning point. Desert Storm is launched. 135,000 Iraqis are killed. An estimated one million Iraqis, many of them children and old people, then die as a result of 10 years of sanctions. One small problem. There never were any incubator baby deaths. Not one. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's investigative flagship program, The Fifth Estate, reveals the girl to be the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, given her lines and coached in acting by the giant American PR firm Hill & Knowlton. It's one phase in a $10 million joint U.S.-Kuwaiti campaign of deception. This man is lying. I myself buried 14 newborn babies that had been taken from their incubators. This man is lying. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. There were a lot of people who participated in a conspiracy. Yes, an out-and-out -out conspiracy of fake organizations, false documents, fraud, and disinformation. So, if a new man named Bush is in the White House, and helps engineer a brazen deception in order to achieve global geopolitical goals as well as domestic and personal ones, it wouldn't be a first, would it? So did the prostitutes tell you the truth then? Did your media tell you the truth? Did your government tell you the truth? There's been a million dead Iraqis. Is it a holocaust yet, Sharon viewers? Okay, here's Gerald Salente. Yeah, what if the number one crop in Libya was broccoli? What if that was the big export? Here you go. Well, Gerald Salente from the Trends Research Institute says NATO is just a cover for the U.S. and the Libyan mission is about gaining control of the country's oil. When people get killed or there are strikes in Afghanistan that kill innocent people, they always use the term NATO. It's mostly the U.S. And yes, the uh, Prime Minister of Turkey is 100 percent correct. Again, the hypocrisy is before our very own eyes. So all this is, is the United States doing what it's become accustomed to do, and that is attack any country it wants to at any time for any reason that it could make up. And the new reason that they made up is perfectly Orwellian humanitarian crisis. So you kill people to solve a humanitarian crisis and you take dictators out that you don't like because really what's behind this? And I've said it before, would the United States be in Iraq if their major export was broccoli? Or would they be in Libya if they weren't holding on to the sweetest of sweet crude oil on the planet? All right. I'm going to give you a little bit of, you know, you got your Republican, I think, uh, Rand Paul. Here's a Democrat, Dennis Kucinich. A little bit, I've actually got a two, but here you go. A little bit of Dennis Kucinich for you. More than 200 years ago, it was the awareness of the unchecked arrogance of George III that led our founders to carefully and deliberately balance our Constitution articulating the rights of Congress in Article I as the primary check by our citizens against the dangers they foresaw for our Republic. Our Constitution was derived from the human and political experience of our founders who were aware of what happens when one person took it upon himself to assume rights and privileges which placed him above everyone else. But where, asked Tom Paine in his 
famous tract, Common Sense, where's the King of America? I'll tell you, friend, he reigns above and doth not make havoc of mankind like the royal of Britain. So far as we approve of monarchy, that in America the law is king. For as in absolute governments the king is law, so in free countries the law ought to be king. And there ought to be no other, said Thomas Paine in Common Sense. The power to declare war is firmly and explicitly vested in the Congress of the United States under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. That is the law. The law is king. Let us make no mistake about it. Dropping 2,000-pound bombs and unleashing the massive firepower of our Air Force on the capital of a sovereign state is in fact an act of war. And no amount of legal, legal acrobatics can make it otherwise. It is the arrogance of power which former Senator from Arkansas, Jay Fulbright, saw shrouded in the deceit which carried us into the abyss of another war in Vietnam. My generation was determined that we would never see another Vietnam. It was the awareness of the unchecked power and arrogance of the executive which led Congress to pass the War Powers Act. Congress, through the War Powers Act, provided the executive with an exception to unilaterally respond only when the nation was in actual or imminent danger to repel sudden attacks. Mr. Speaker, today we are in a constitutional crisis because we have an administration that has assumed for itself powers to wage war which are neither expressly defined nor implicit in the Constitution nor permitted under the War Powers Act. This is a challenge not just to the administration but to this Congress itself. A president has no right to wrest that fundamental power from the Congress. And we have no right to cede it to him. We, members of Congress, can no more absolve a president of his responsibility to obey this profound constitutional mandate than can absolve ourselves of our failure to rise to the instant challenge to our Constitution that is before us today. We violate our sacred trust to the citizens of the United States and our oath to uphold the Constitution if we surrender this great responsibility and through our inaction acquiesce in another terrible war. We must courageously defend the oath we took to defend the Constitution of the United States. Or we forfeit our right to participate in representative government. 